So I want to speak this morning. And it's a really interesting message. I've never preached this one, but I, I, I believe it. Uh, I've entitled the message, Your Enemy Neighbor. And it's in Luke chapter 10. Most of us know the story as the Good Samaritan. I'll give you a moment to find it. Luke chapter 10, we'll pick this story up at verse 25 because that's really where it belongs. Verse 25, Luke chapter 10, and we're going to share this story. If you have it, say yes. I think a few more people need to find it. It'll be on the screen as well. Here it is. It's about Jesus, and he tells a story. Isn't that interesting? You know, Amy has ladies telling a story. Uh, Jesus was a storyteller. Anybody knows if you speak. It's to tell a story. People want to know the story, a true story. So here's Jesus, and he's going to tell a story, but the background of the story is this. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, you have to understand when the scripture says here, a, a lawyer, it's, it's more than just someone who would prosecute or defend against someone who had committed a crime. But these lawyers in Bible times knew the law. They were able to be experts in what the scripture said. And so they'd be able to quote scripture. It was very common for them to quote scripture. And this lawyer is used to litigating. And uh, a good lawyer, we've got, to, I'd love to tell you some of my lawyer jokes, but we have lawyers in the congregation. So I should just move on, but I've got a real good lawyer joke. But I, I won't tell you unless you prevail upon me. You know, I didn't want to do this, but you insist. Do you know, you know, when a lawyer passes away, they don't bury the lawyer the usual six feet under. They bury a lawyer 12 feet down. Do you know why? Because down deep, they're good people. I'll probably be prosecuted for that, of defamation of character and all the other things that come up. So anyway, next time I'll tell a pastor's joke. I digress. This lawyer knew the Bible. And the scripture says here, he's, he, he's asking, teacher, he's talking to Jesus, what do I have to do to get eternal life? Understand that it's always loaded. You see, he's testing Jesus. He said to him, that is, Jesus says to the lawyer, what is written in, in the law? What is your reading of it? In other words, you know the small print. You know the fine language. You know the different parts of what is termed the old covenant or the law. How do you read it? So because he is a good lawyer, he says this. And he answers from the scriptures. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He's quoting from Deuteronomy and from Leviticus. Jesus says to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. Do this and you're going to have a lifetime of happiness. In other words, it's not preach this, it's do this goes on. But he, <laughs> being a lawyer, wanted to justify himself. See, he understands when someone's guilty, when someone's innocent. And he was feeling his own guilt. And he wants to justify himself, and so he says to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Can't you just hear something like that? ringing out in, in the chambers uh, of, of the justice hall? Who is my neighbor? What a great question. Who is my neighbor? But you see, you, you never want to get into a match with Jesus. Because if you say this, he already knows where you all going. He does. 
And this lawyer, the legal expert of the scriptures, is trying to catch Jesus. And he says, well, you know, I, he's trying to justify himself now. He's got some inner conflict going on. He understands the law real well. So his question is this, well, who's my neighbor? Well, it's time for a story. It's time for a story. I like that. You know, a story will kind of break the news slowly rather than no or yes. Instead, I'll tell you a story. So the story goes like this. Jesus answered and said to him, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, I'm not going to get into all of the figurative language here, but you've got to catch some of it. If you go from Jerusalem to Jericho, it's about 17 to 20 miles. I've gone on a bus ride down there. And when you go from Jerusalem to Jericho, you're going from a mountain area 3,000 feet down into a canyon. There, there are cliffs there. It's, it's very rocky. It literally is a treacherous pathway, uh, a narrow road to get there. So it says here, a certain man went down. It, it's literally... This man is going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell among thieves. A lot of, of, of the robbers would hang out there. Who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. If you read this portion of scripture in that spiritual figurative language, which I'm not going to get into this morning, you'll discover that half dead is what a lot of people are today, meaning they're alive physically, mentally, and emotionally, but spiritually they're dead. They're half dead. So the scripture says here, now by chance, wouldn't you know it, it just so happens that a priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. A preacher, a religious leader, someone who would lead in the temple and the tabernacle or something like that. And he saw the man who was beaten, robbed, and left as half dead. He passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, a religious person who helps priests. So this person's very religious too. And he arrived at the place, came and looked. Hmm. He's beaten up. And then he passed by on the other side and he left. You know the story. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion couple of things here that I want us to catch. You have to go where people are. You don't have to do what they do, but you have to go where a person is. And sometimes it's just in your mind and your heart. You try to travel the corridors of their life. You know their background, and you have to go there somehow to get to the place to where the person really is. If you don't get to where they are, you'll start somewhere else and they'll never be able to follow you. So this Samaritan man comes where this man is who was beaten and robbed, left for dead. Scripture says he looked at him, he saw him, and he had compassion. I like the Bible word compassion. It literally comes from uh, two Latin words, calm meaning with, and passion. In other words, you're, you're having your emotions stirred up with something. It's, that's what compassion is. It, compassion isn't just, I, I hope something lands on me now that will make me a nice person. It means it's relatable to something. It's passion with the situation. The Samaritan comes like that, and here's what he does. It says, verse 34, So he went to him and bandaged his wounds. Pouring oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn. So if you take that 20 mile trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, about halfway, you'll see the ruins of where that inn was. He took him to the inn. And the scripture says, and took care of him. Took care of him. I don't know what that means. Uh, you know, he's pouring oil, he's pouring wine, and 
He's got a few things. He's got some cloth. He's, he's not a paramedic. He didn't call an ambulance. He's just using the stuff that he's got. On the next day, when he departed, that is this Samaritan man, he took out two denarii. So one denarii would be the average salary that you would have for a day's work. He takes out two denarii. And he gives them to the innkeeper. Now this is interesting because as much as I can figure out, two denarii would allow this man who was beaten and robbed to stay at the inn for two months. What it tells me is he was really beat up bad. He was beat up real bad. In fact, he was a death star. Come, uh, you know, just if, if you think about it, think about it. Two months, convalescing, trying to move his limbs around, maybe even just touch and go. The Samaritan man says, here, I'll give you two denarii. I'll give you two silver coins. That's what it really means. It's, it's two silver coins. Literally, you'll have it come out in some of the Bible versions. It's very interesting when it gets into this kind of language. Because silver in the Old Testament always speaks of redemption. Something being refined. Something being brought back. Something being redeemed. Something that was lost and you can bring it back. Two silver coins come out. And the man says, listen, you know, I've got to go. But if, if, if he needs anything more, honestly, I'll cover that too. Take care of him. Whatever more you spend when I come again. I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And this lawyer says, he who showed mercy on him. He doesn't name him the Samaritan. He says, he doesn't want to use the word Samaritan, who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The story's over. Martin Luther King Jr., Dan Carter, told me the story. He read Martin Luther King Jr.'s sermon, preached on this particular portion of Scripture. And King said this, I'm unlike the priest and the Levite. My concern isn't what will happen to me if I help the man who was robbed. My concern is what will happen to me if I don't help him. What will go on inside of me of being desensitized? What will go on inside of me if I don't help someone who really needs help? King understood that. You can't go neutral in these things. The question of the lawyer was this. Who's my neighbor? Jesus tells the story. It's fascinating because you have a priest do you have a Levite? Do you have a Samaritan? Now this is where it really gets interesting because it's a big part of the story. In fact, I, I, I think it's the game breaker. There are going to be two levels that will go on. And I want to give you the first level of what it really is in its context. The Samaritan was someone who was half Jew and half something else. And I'll describe it in a minute. The northern part of Israel, when it was conquered, became Samaria. The city was there, but also the whole region of the northern part of Israel. It was divided and conquered. The northern part of Israel was called Samaria. The Assyrians from the north conquered the Samarians. The Assyrians take them away, and those who were Jewish in the northern part of the kingdom there were taken off to Assyria. They married, intermarried, and so they were known as half-breeds. Not fully Jewish, just half. They were taken away to another country. And then when they returned, the Jews, those who were fully Jew, hated the Samaritans. Hated. Gotta get this. 
It's why it was so phenomenal when Jesus went to the well in John chapter 4 and he talked to the woman at the well who was a Samaritan woman. They didn't even talk to one another. The Jews hated the Samaritans. Well, you got to believe that the Samaritans hated the Jews too. So here's where the story's going. It's not just a third person who wasn't a preacher. It's not just someone who was non-religious. It was an enemy who was brought into the picture and the enemy was going to give an answer to a problem. It's the most amazing thing. Hold on to that thought and grab a hold of this story because you've got to see this too. The lawyer says this, well, who's my neighbor? Because he's wanting to justify himself. You notice that Jesus says in verse 36, so which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? We think that being a good person is to find someone in need and some neighbor who has needs and help the neighbor who has a need. That's how the story started. Who is my neighbor? Jesus ends by speaking of the story, and he says, the neighbor isn't the man who was beaten and robbed. The neighbor was one of the three. He says, the real neighbor is who you are. It's either the priest, or it's the Levite, or the neighbor is the Samaritan. And you are it. And then you don't have to worry about who's my neighbor. You don't have to be selective. It's just wherever you go, you're the neighbor and you help everybody. <clears throat> Who is my neighbor? Trying to figure it out. Jesus finishes his story and he says, which one of the three do you think was neighbor? He's talking about him, not the robbed, robbed person. But more than that, this is the real context of it. I want us to catch this too. I want to say a couple of things at the same time. The neighbor turned out to be, which one of the three was the neighbor? Was it the priest? No. He had his reasons. He was too busy. He was late for church. He was the pastor of the place that had to get there fast. Was it the Levite? No, no, no. But he had a good look. He's able to assess it so that he could be able to, you know, if for chance he ran, ran into somebody who did, you know, offer help to people, he'd be sure to be able to tell them exactly what the guy needed. Who's the neighbor? The Samaritan. Who's the Samaritan? The enemy. Here's what I want us to grab. Did you know that God will oftentimes meet your need through a Samaritan enemy? Fascinating. You say, where do you get that from besides here? Well, I'm glad you asked. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 7 says this. How many would have ever wondered about this verse that says this. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. In other words, when it says when a man's ways, or in another version will say when a person's path, it means when you're doing the right thing, when you're fulfilling the call and the purpose and the, the, the whole destiny of God's plan for your life, when you're, you're, you're about that, you're doing that, you're in the way, it's the path that you're on, that pleases the Lord. Here's what God said he'll do. I'll cause your enemies to bring you peace. Now, that doesn't mean they'll come along and go, Oh, just peace, Doug. Lullaby, lullaby. No, 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 no. Peace is shalom. 
you'll find wholeness. Wholeness. Even your enemies will bring you wholeness. You say, how could that happen? Oh, that's the story of the Good Samaritan. It was the Samaritan, an enemy. Some people say, I hate that group of people. I hate that, you know, and they'll name a, a leader. I despise that, and they'll name somebody else. And they'll say, I don't like the Toronto Maple Leafs, or, you know, they, they've got all these people, you know, that they can say things. God says, you know what? If you understand this truth, if you will be about my business, I will cause Samaritans, in other words, enemy even, to come and meet you in your need. There'll be two silver coins and everything else that you would need so that you can go on your way. Now, Jesus fulfilled that fully as the one who redeems us. But it's talking then about two things. One is, who's your neighbor? Your enemy. Some people say, well, I, you know, I don't like that. I don't like that person. And I don't like my boss now. The boss changed, and I, I don't like the boss either. I wonder if God doesn't have you lined up to receive tremendous blessings through a Samaritan. And your first thought might have been, I'll curse that guy. And God says, oh, don't do that. This guy is actually the one that I'm going to use. No, but Lord, you know that I really like them coming this way toward me. And God says, no, I was kind of thinking of sending a Samaritan. I don't like that group. Well, I, I was kind of thinking a Samaritan. But more like an enemy than anything else. Precisely. I was, you know, I can just, if you will do what you're supposed to do, even your enemies will give you fullness. It's amazing. Somebody says, you know, I've got an enemy. You should have lots. Beware when all people speak well of you. But it's not your problem. Well, to a degree, I suppose it is. It's not an absolute statement. There are many things that we can do to become more friendly. But there's a truth here. A truth here. That the surprise package, the Samaritan, the one who actually was involved in the the whole hate situation became the greatest lover. It was a package of blessing that was wrapped up in a kind of a raw, disguised form. The robber, or the person who was robbed, probably was Jewish. He could have looked up and said, excuse me, I don't talk to people like you. Can't you just see that? Reminds me of that cute little story. You know it, so I'll just give you the bits and pieces of it. The guy was on the island, and he's trying to get off. He's going to die there. He's on the island. Helicopter flies over, and he says, no, no, I, I, I can't. I, you know, I'm waiting for God to de deliver me. And, and then a boat comes by, and they say, come on, get on the boat. And he says, no, I can't. I'm waiting for God to deliver me. And, and f finally, no one else comes. And God says, I sent the helicopter, and I sent the boat. God will in his economy, send you an enemy. It's fascinating. That's what this story is about. And you'll think, enough of that person. And, and you'll, you'll, you'll just want to write that person off. And God says, I'll use that group of people. I'll use that person. I'll use those people. No, but I'm looking for someone who looks like a priest and looks like a Levite but acts like a Samaritan. God says, no, I'd rather send you a Samaritan who looks like one, but doesn't act like one. Fascinating. Who'd have thunk up a story like that? Huh? And then there's that next layer. It's just, who's my neighbor? That's how it, the story begins. Who's my neighbor? And Jesus turns it around and he says, which one of the three is the neighbor? Now it's no longer looking for a bad situation. It's, I am the neighbor. And I'm going to have to go out with love in every direction. And I love what King said. My concern 
isn't what will happen to me if I help people. My concern is what will happen to me if I don't help people. If I don't. I want you to stand with me, please. They call it the Good Samaritan. You know what word we would use for that today? It's an oxymoron. You hated those dirty, rotten Samaritans. But it's called a good Samaritan. The enemy bringing blessing. What situation are you looking at right now? You think, this is the enemy looking at me? And I'm just, you know, and you're ready to do your stuff on that person. Or that group. Or that office. What if, you'll have to discern it, but what if, what if it was a Samaritan who was sent by God to bring blessing to your life and many others? What if, what if? Are we so used to the priest and Levitical garb that unless it's dressed a certain way, that we would think that God's not there? Have you sent away the helicopter and the boat and here? It's, it's God saying, I'm right there. Here's what it'll take. It'll take discernment. It'll take discernment. But when a man's ways please the Lord, when you're about your father's business, when you're in the path, Proverbs is all about that, the path. The path is a metaphorical word that speaks of the journey of your life. You're doing what you believe God wants you to do. And when you're in that path and you're on that journey, God says even your enemies will make peace with you. I believe that what it really means is you'll find fullness. It'll be amazing. Uh, amazing the different things that will happen and, and the supply that will come because for every one of these situations there's two shekels of silver. There's redemption. There's something there. And if you have eyes to see, Jesus is, is, is looking at, at, at this, this litigator. Jesus is looking at this man who's trying to wiggle this way and wiggle that way. So he knows he'll have to tell a story. Because this man has a sharp mind. He knows that what started out here ends up here. And he knows this man is going to be caught. So he simply says, you ought to be like that Samaritan. Go and do that. Go and do that too. I believe, grab this because this is, this is I, I'm ending with the foundation. The fun, if, if we use a house metaphor, uh, me, metaphor I've, I've got the foundation on top of the house now. But here it is. I believe that the best days for the church are right now if we'll live out the story of the good Samaritan. The world is waiting for us to, by chance, go from Jerusalem to Jericho. 3,000 feet, 20 miles. You just drop, you drop, you drop, you drop. Until finally you'll find someone who fell. And that's when ministry begins. Father, we thank you for your presence. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Only you can change our crusty hearts into soft, pliable hearts that will have compassion. We were fooled in the story. We thought the Samaritan was the one we needed to hate when it was the Samaritan who went where the person was and had mercy and compassion and knew that there was redemption. There could be two silver coins that would turn this guy's life around. We ask, touch us, Holy Spirit. Not just on Sunday, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Touch us, touch us, Lord. Do your work in us. Do you have to 
steal the garbs that we wear so that what we wear is just what we wear. It's not who we are. And we ask, Holy Spirit, allow us to live the Jesus life, that we would do that and do that and do that. We know we can't do everything. And I just release people even this morning who feel bondage that they have to be all things and do all. And, and, you know, every letter that comes in the mail, they have to give to everybody. Every situation they have to be involved in. You can't do that. But you have a pathway. You have a pathway. And on the pathway, you will meet enemies. And they will be your greatest blessing. Father, we pray for those who are on the pathway. And I ask that you would make every one of us neighbors like the good Samaritan. I ask in the name of Jesus that you would allow us to be on the pathway and find fullness and wholeness. We'd spend our silver coins. We'd take the coins out of our pocket and spend them to be spent for God like the silver that's in our pocket to be spent on others, on people. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I pray that you would heal us from the disintegration that's happened in our spirits because we haven't done things that we should have done. We've been desensitized. I don't even know what it means, folk. I'll be honest with you. I'll use words that we understand. I don't know what it means. Because it's easy to hate people who behead you. I don't know what that all means other than it means what it says. Somewhere we have to enter into the game of living it out. Paul Johnson knows this. He goes to the different countries of the world. People are being martyred for their faith. In our own country, there are rights and freedoms of, of Christians that are being taken away. What does it mean? That we just get mad at those people and hate them? Or is there a blessing if we will be people of the way and of the path? Is there a blessing that God can bring? He says, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 7. He says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he'll make even his enemies to make peace with them. We ask, Lord, that this would be a day when business is good. This would be a time when business is real good. That we'd have discernment. We wouldn't just live as natural people who don't know the Lord. But if you could love people from the cross, how much more do we want to love people when we're off the cross? So do your work in us. Do your work in us. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed, every eye closed, all across the auditorium, there may be people here this morning I feel such a presence of God because this is what people want. You know, there's something that resonates. Jesus' story is what people want. They're thinking, I want to meet a Jesus like that. It tells a story, touches my heart. If you're here this morning, you say, I need the Lord. I need Jesus in my life. I want to live for Jesus. I want to live this way. You, you know that you can't do it just in your own strength. You're willing to turn from yourself and you say, I want forgiveness of sin this morning. I'm willing to let Jesus be the Lord of my life. I want, I want prayer for that. Put your hand up high so that I can see it and then you can put it down. Just hold it up for a moment. Just hold it up high. Over on my left side, I see your hand. Two hands over here, you can put them down. Thank you so much. I'll pray with you in just a moment. Anybody else? You say, I need the Lord. In the middle section here, I, I see uh, two hands there as well. Thank you. You can put your hands down. We'll pray in just a moment. Anyone else? Up in the balcony, the main floor, over on the left side, there may be a hand up there. Just not sure. Both hands are up. I'm just going to wait just a moment longer. You need the Lord. You need Jesus. We're going to pray. Just look at me for a moment, please. I do this almost every Sunday. And I remember one Sunday when I did it, and I wasn't giving it, I responded to it. I remember that Sunday too. Here's what I'd like you to do. And I'll tell you why. I'll, I'll try to be real brief. But I'm going to ask in just a moment, 
that you'd come to the front here and face me. And Jesus says this. It's another one of his stories. He said, if you confess me before people, in other words, if you're not embarrassed about me, then I won't be embarrassed about talking to my Father about you. In other words, God the Father. There's something about a public confession. We have water baptism and there are times for that. I'm going to ask that you'd come with somebody. If you raised your hand, just come with somebody so you don't have to come alone. You can come as a group of 20 if you want. I, I would do that. I, I've walked, you know, down these aisles. It's a long way. If you're up in the balcony, just move out. Come right up here, and I'm going to pray with you right here. So wherever you are, if you're in the middle row, just, just kind of tell people, just move back a little bit. I need to get out of here. That's right, you come. I can see a lady moving right now. Just come. Come right now. God bless you. It takes courage to do that. Both of you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Coming down. Coming down the, the balcony as well. That's right. You just take your time. Somebody help her. Just somebody right there. There you are. Just help her. That's right. That's right. You come. You come. You come to Jesus. You come to Jesus. You come to Jesus. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Still coming, still coming. We need the Lord. We need the Lord. Jesus tells a story. He loves us. When Amy Chatta had she speaks. She asked ladies to tell a story because the discovery was that if these ladies told their story, it would turn out to be my story. When Jesus tells this story, you think I can see myself in this story. I see myself in this story. That's, that's me there. This is what I want. This is what I need. So we're going to pray a prayer. I can promise you I can promise you that Jesus loves you just as you are. There's nothing that you have to do to, to be loved for. He loves you just as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you this way. He's going to wash all of your past sins away. I mean everything, no matter what it is, everything. We're going to have re reset, recalibration of your life, and he'll do it. He'll do it. He'll do it. So let's pray this prayer right now. Lord Jesus, I've sinned against you, and I've broken your laws. I know I've hurt your heart, and I know I've damaged my own heart. So I ask you to heal me this morning. I want to be a lover of God and a lover of people. I turn from my sin. Wash it all away by your precious blood. Come into my body right now. Be alive in me right now. I put my faith in you alone. From this time onward, I'm going to live for you. I love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.